discipleship, Jesus, uh, there is nothing like glorifying your name. There's nothing like bringing praise and glory and honor and worship to you because you alone are worthy. And as we continue this morning here in Acts chapter 10 and we see this miracle, this moment where you brought the Gentiles into the family, you told Peter that they were on equal ground because we're all on equal ground before you, Jesus. I pray that we would see today this, this continued story of how you used Peter to bring salvation to Cornelius' house and what that means for us today, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. So look, everybody, we've uh, we got a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to jump in here in a second. Um, and so what we're going to do is explain, we're going to do a quick review, explain the text we're in today, preach through that, and then I'm going to bring some clarity at the end to an issue that trips a lot of people up in the church today, and then at the end we have a gift for you. You're thinking, man, I picked the right day to come today. Yes, you did. So uh, last week we said, and I, and I told you last week, I was not using hyperbole when I said this, this is one of the most important chapters in the Bible, Acts chapter 10, as it opens the gates Right? As God says, Gentiles are welcome, Gentiles are on equal ground. This is huge. Without Acts chapter 10, we're not here this morning. So that's why this is such an important chapter for us to go through. So at the beginning of chapter 10, the story starts with Peter. Peter is on the coast in a town called Joppa. And he is there, he has healed people, he actually, God used him to raise someone from the dead. You don't hear about that every day. And he's hanging out with this guy named Simon. And maybe, maybe Peter, you know how when you meet somebody with the same first name as you, you, you have a natural you know, kinship there. And he's there with this guy named Simon. However, Simon was a tanner, which was a no-no. But this is just the beginning of what's going to happen. So Peter, he's hanging out at the coast. And he's in Joppa. Well, while he's happening, while he's down there, meanwhile, across the screen, right, uh, up north, about 30 miles in this town called Caesarea, there is a Gentile guy from Italy. His name is Cornelius. Let's all say Cornelius. Ready? Cornelius, all right? He's a, he's a good guy. Good guy. And they actually, uh, I found some drone footage from 2,000 years ago of Caesarea. I have it up here for you. So pretty amazing, huh? Just, who knew? So, uh, but this is what, honestly, because of archaeology, and a lot of research, and a lot of descriptions, both in the Bible and other sources. It's a good idea. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And Cornelius is in charge of the Roman regimen, uh, this legion that's there. And the, the, the Scripture tells us that he was a, a devout man. And to the best of his ability, with the revelation God had given him through general revelation, and through no doubt some familiar, familiarity with the Jewish Scriptures, he was, uh, he seek God sought hard after God, said he prayed, he gave alms, he did all these things, and, and we mentioned last week, the, the exciting part about it says that God took notice of that. So God sends an angel to Cornelius, the angel shows up, and the angel says, you send some of your guys, some of your, your men and one of your servants, and go down to Joppa and find this guy named Peter. So that's happening 30 miles north of Joppa. While that's happening, Peter, down in Joppa, he's hungry. He wants some lunch. So he orders some lunch, and he, here he is on the coast down there in Joppa, and he goes up to the roof while they're prepping his meal, and he goes up there to spend some time himself in prayer. Peter has no idea what's happened 30 miles north in Caesarea. So while Peter is there, uh, it says he falls into this trance-like state, and God sends him this vision. And in this vision, this giant blanket, this sail, this picnic blanket, if you will, comes down from heaven, and everything on there is an abomination to Peter. All right, there's, there is shrimp, and there is a, a crawfish and lobster, and there's ham, and there's sausage, and there's all these things, and we're like, woo, and he's like, ew. And all this stuff comes down, and God says to Peter, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. Because right? there's these animals on this thing. And Peter says, uh, no, Lord. God says, do it. He says, Peter, do it. He does this three times. So after the third time, the, the Scripture says, Peter's sitting there, perplexed, thinking, what in the world does this mean? And while he's on that roof, at, out, out on the street, 
These guys are yelling out, hey, is Simon Peter, is this the house he's at? And Peter's about to find out real quickly that God meant what he said. So where we pick up today is when these guys, they show up, the, uh, the men from Cornelius, they show up and they're asking where Peter is. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, so when we look at this, uh, these first two verses we're going to pick up on, I want you to keep this in mind, uh, 23 to 24. Salvation requires that someone go and tell. Every one of us here this morning, somebody told you about Jesus. How many of you, your mom told you about Jesus? Look at that. Moms, that's why you're so important. Best thing in the world a mom could ever do is tell their kid about Jesus. But salvation requires that we go and tell. Romans tells us, how will they hear without a what, church? A preacher. Thanks, Tom. One guy knows his Bible. Sweet. So how will they hear without a preacher? So let's, it's going to pick it up here in verse 23. All right? It says, so Peter went down. He goes to these men and he says, I am the one whom you are looking for. It's, you'll notice this little dialogue back and forth they have. Peter, what does Peter say here? He goes, what is the reason for your coming? Do you understand that God did not tell Cornelius why he was doing this, and God has not told Peter yet why he's doing what he's doing? So everybody's kind of, it's like that picture of you know, the three Spider-Men that are all pointing at each other, like who knows what's going on. That's what's happening here. And so, so they say, hey, God told us to come find you. Peter's like, great, for what? They haven't put things together yet. God hasn't done that. So... So he, he calls them up and he says, what's the reason for your coming? And they said, hey, Cornelius, he's a centurion. He's an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole congregation. Okay, this is 22. He was directed by an angel, uh, verse 23, so he invited them in to be his guests. The next day, they get up and they go on this two-day journey together. Peter wisely takes, it says here, some of the brothers from Joppa, uh, Joppa accompanying him. So Peter takes some of the Jewish men with him, which is brilliant because they're going to be witnesses. The Bible, the text doesn't say this to us directly, but does anybody know from at the end of Acts chapter 8 who's in this region? Philip is up there. So I don't know if Philip is there or not, it doesn't say, but maybe Philip is a part of this, who knows? But nonetheless, he, he, he invites some of his Jewish brothers, and they go down, it says here, uh, to accompany him. So on the following day, they entered Caesarea. And they're going to go here together. Cornelius was expecting them. Look at this. And he had called together his relatives and his close friends. Cornelius doesn't even know Jesus yet, and he's already inviting people to come meet Jesus. I mean, that's really amazing. Like, so many of these things in Scripture, if we don't really look at this, we miss out at some of the profoundity here. Here's a guy who doesn't know Jesus yet. Doesn't even know, he, Cornelius has no idea why Peter's coming. But he is expected on God, he's counting on great things, and he says, hey, come and listen to this guy who God is going to send to us. Salvation requires that someone go and tell. Now look, church, we should be all in on this. Okay, that's why if you look at your bulletin, it mentions that in, in a few weeks on a Wednesday night, June 5th, uh, we're going to have a meeting for something we're doing called the Timothy Trust. Timothy Trust is going to be a fund that we use to help support uh, uh, people who are going into ministry. One of the dysfunctions of how the system works for people to get into ministry is oftentimes they go to school and they have to take loans to go to school, <laughs> so then they get out of school and they have debt, and then they go work at a church. And let me tell you from experience, when you show up at a church and get a job, you don't make much money. Okay? I, I remember the first job that my wife and I had in ministry. We qualified for every government assistance program under the sun. So uh, part of the, the challenge for young, young men and women heading into ministry is the financial cost of education. As it should, like, a good education shouldn't be free. Teachers, I'm thankful for teachers and professors, professors and people in the education system. But what we want to do as a church is get behind, right, those who are here, those who are working with us, those who God may use to go through our church and then be sent out. So if you are interested, right, this, this, we're going to have this information meeting, we're going to talk about it. But here's what's crazy. God is so amazing. How many of you know how amazing God is this morning? God is amazing. So... It's been heavy on my heart, this idea about supporting young men and women. 
I was here on a Saturday night a couple of months ago. I was praying about it. The next Sunday morning, probably 10 hours after I was here, somebody met me in the foyer and they said, hey, do you have any plans on establishing some type of fund to help the, 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 these interns and people who are going into ministry? And they, I looked at them like I saw a ghost, like what's happening here. And I said, oh, funny, you should say that. Yes, I was praying about that like 10 hours ago. They said, oh, well, we recently came across an inheritance and we just feel like God is calling us to support our, our, these, these young people in our, in our church who are going into ministry. Folks, that's not a coincidence, right? That's God. And that's the kind of stuff, this stuff like we see here in Acts, God still does these amazing things, doesn't he? So cool stuff here. Look, salvation requires, somebody has to go and tell. You know there's that silly little phrase, go and preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. It's necessary, okay? Let's just settle that. Somebody has to tell. So salvation requires that somebody go and tell. The next two verses we'll see here is salvation, 25 to 26. Salvation requires that we see sinners as ourselves. Now, you may ask, well, Chris, do you mean we need to see ourselves as sinners for salvation? Or do you mean we need to see those who are coming to salvation as fellow sinners? Yes. You need to see yourself as a sinner to be saved, to be sure, but you also understand, as we'll see here, that we, we all are on equal ground, right? Like, 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 it's like flying southwest. Every, whether you're in, a, in seat row one or 28, everybody's equal. There's no first class. So let's go ahead and look at the scripture here. 23, 24. I'm sorry, 24, uh, 25, 26. So, and, and as he talked with them. So Peter enters Cornelius and he met him. So Cornelius, it says, he met Peter and he fell down at his feet, at Peter's feet, and he worshipped him. Peter's like, about time. No, that is not what Peter said. Peter picks him up and he's like, hey man, stand up. I too am a man. This is important. Right? This is not Pope Peter saying it's about time someone validates that. Which, this is a long time coming. No, Peter's like, don't, don't you dare worship me. I am a sinful man just like you. And I know we've got some saints in here that have been sanctified, and in, 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 in your level of holiness is profound and wonderful, but you're still a sinner. We're all still sinners. And whenever God sends somebody to this church and through these doors, and we're going to look at this more in a few weeks when we look at the results of when Peter goes back to Jerusalem, let me just say, we, we cannot have our, our, our nose up in the air. We cannot put our head in the ground, right? Look, salvation requires that we don't forget where we came from. Okay? Uh, Paul talks to the Corinthians and he talks about, he, he lays out this kind of litany, this list of sins. And he says, and such were some of you. In other words, don't forget, that's where you came from. And that's where we all come from. We all need to remember that, that we, Jesus saved us. And that same grace that saved us from our sin, God is still doing that with others. So salvation requires that we see sinners as ourselves. 27 through 29, continuing on here, what do we see? Salvation requires what? That objections be overcome. Salvation requires that objections be overcome. Scripture tells us that we are to be equipped and prepared and, uh, and ready to answer objections and to share truth. 27 through 29 tells us about this. So, Peter says, hey man, stand up, I'm a man too. And as he talked with him, it says Peter walks in and he finds many people there. So Cornelius is expecting something big. Peter walks in. Peter still is trying to figure out what's going on here. And look what happens. Peter, Peter just, I like this, he, he addresses the elephant in the room. Peter says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to even visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. All right, you see the light bulbs going on now in Peter's mind? He's connecting the dots here. So when I was set for, I, I came without objection. I asked then 
Why you sent for me? <laughs> They're still pointing at each other. But what's happening here is Peter, every, nobody's, nobody has said this. It's got to be awkward. Peter entering a house full of Gentiles. Peter had never done that. Jews didn't do that. They, were, they would consider that honestly repulsive for them. So Peter's like, hey, I know this is weird. I know this is awkward. But obviously God has done this for a reason. And he just addresses the obstacles or the objections that might be there. And it is our job when it comes to salvation to help people get past or through these objections. Right? Sometimes when, 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 when Jesus brings somebody, when God brings somebody, when the Holy Spirit brings somebody into the family, man, they're like a, rap, a ripe apple that's just going to fall off the tree at the slightest breeze. But then there are others who have things to work through. And that's why we have to have time and patience. That's why the church has to be a place where people can come and ask questions. And we're not in a, we shouldn't be in a hurry, so let's hurry up and get you through your questions now. No, let's, let's, we listen and we talk and, and, and we help people see the truth of the Scriptures. Because salvation requires that objections be overcome. So now that Peter has said, <laughs> I love that, he's like, so when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why you sent for me? And Cornelius is like, I don't know, you tell me, I obeyed God. So we're going to see here in these next few verses, 30 to 33, what they realize and what happens is this. Salvation requires that God sovereignly work. Amen? God, look, God, salvation requires that God be in this and of it. You ever, uh, isn't it funny when somebody who lived a life of sin and lived a life just chasing hard after sin, and then you haven't seen them in a long time, and then all of a sudden you find they've changed, and people say, hey, man, Fred, Fred used to just be this awful guy. What happened to Fred? Oh, Fred found Jesus. And I think that that phrase, I always kind of like snicker at that phrase because Jesus isn't lost. We didn't find Jesus, right? What I know is I didn't find Jesus. Jesus found me. And when it comes to Fred or whoever else it might be, the, Jesus found them. But we understand here that this salvation, the Bible is very, very clear. Salvation is a sovereign work of God. So 30 through 33, Cornelius says, hey, Peter, look, now it's been four days. Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Peter's like, yeah, I know all about that. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you to come, or sent for you to, at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, the, can you picture this, y'all? Therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So tag Peter, you're it. You tell us, why are you here? God has certainly given you a message to bring to us. And it all starts because God has this sovereign work and it's beautiful how He responds and He draws and it's just a great picture here of what's happening in salvation in our lives. So salvation requires that God sovereignly work. Now we're going to get to the meat of the message and Peter is going to preach the gospel to them. What does the gospel require? The gospel requires the resurrection. So Peter's going to preach Christ crucified and Christ resurrected. So 34 to 43, what do we see in our text? Salvation requires the foundation of the resurrection. Salvation requires the foundation of the resurrection. Look, if there is no resurrection, there's no what? There's no salvation. No resurrection no salvation. So in verse 34, Cornelius says, preach to us, Peter. Tell us what God has given you. Peter opens his mouth and he says, truly, I get it. I understand. I, I, I figured it out. God shows no partiality. If you've got a Bible there, circle that in your Bible. No partiality. That's so important for the church to understand. God shows no partiality. Neither should we. 
So Peter's like, wow, this is, this is absolutely amazing. No, he shows no partiality, but in every nation, every nation, anybody who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching the gospel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death, by hanging him on a tree. And when he says that, remember, that's a, that's a messianic psalm. These, a lot of these things that Peter says, he's just quoting Old Testament scripture, and Cornelius would have known those scriptures. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. That's the resurrection. Not to all the people, okay, not to all the people at once, but to us, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everybody who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter is just preaching the gospel. And he's telling him, hey, Cornelius, I know you've got an idea of a lot of these things. Peter says you've no doubt heard what happened there. So they, they had a knowledge, perhaps, of the facts about Jesus and what had happened. But Peter says, let me connect these dots to you. Let me explain this to you. This resurrection happens. Jesus conquered death so you could have life. And he, and he preaches the resurrection to them. The, the, that, that's why we, we go to the mat on when it comes to this matter of the resurrection. Right? The, rex, the resurrection of Jesus has been one of the most critiqued and oftentimes challenged, uh, challenged issues or, or tenets of our faith, if you will. Right? That is a hill that we must die on, the resurrection of Jesus. There's all kinds of, of ways. For the last 2,000 years, people have been trying to say it didn't happen. Even after it happened, right, right, Pilate and everybody, they immediately come up with a story to try and act like it didn't happen because they understood if the resurrection happened, it was going to have profound impacts, and it does. So salvation requires, church, the foundation of the resurrection. So Peter is in the middle of preaching this message. And remember, the messages we have recorded in Scripture, it's like the Cliff Notes version, version often. But it's going to say here in these last four verses regarding, or five verses regarding salvation, 44 to 48. Salvation requires that we be born in and of the Spirit. Salvation requires we be born of the Holy Spirit, born in the Holy Spirit. Just like I said, no resurrection, no salvation. Well, hey, no Spirit no salvation. That's Scripture too. No spirit, no salvation. Now, when you look at verse 44, it's great. Peter is just preaching. And while he is in the middle of preaching, God interrupts in a huge way. It says here, while Peter was what? Still saying these things. So it's like he's up in the middle. He's got this crowded house. He's preaching this thing. It says here, the Holy Spirit shows up on all who heard the word. In other words, <clears throat> at this point, they'd heard the gospel, and they're like, hey, Peter, stop. We are ready, because he'll explain this again next chapter. And when he explains what, what happens, Peter says, at that moment they believed. And when they believed, what did they receive, church? The Holy Spirit. So they have believed. So it says here, as this is happening, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. This is exciting. And, and the believers uh, from among the circumcised, that's the Jews there with him, 
who had come with Peter, they're amazed. They are amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Even on the Gentiles. What happened? Just so, so this, if you've been here while we've been going through Acts, you should be thinking Acts chapter 2 now. It says here, the gift of the Spirit was poured out on them, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues, other languages, glossos, all right? And they are praising and worshiping and extolling God. So this is a significant thing here. And if you're tracking here, what hasn't happened yet to these, to these Gentiles? They haven't been baptized, okay? That's an important thing, and that's the issue I'm going to bring some clarity to here in a moment. But for right now, understand that in the middle of... That, that's why, like, when, when we preach the Gospel, if you're here today and, and you're like, yeah, I, I don't know Jesus, but I believe in the resurrection. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I understand I need to repent and turn to Him. But if you, if you believe that message, you, you are saved. You, you have come to that faith. And that's why you know, we, we should never make it difficult for people to come to Jesus. Well, I've got 300 questions now I need to ask you so I can really know. And I've seen people do that. I've seen people say, well, I know they've said it, but I really need to vet them now and, and, and make sure. Well, this says otherwise. All right? So it says here now, uh, in, in verse 47. So, Peter declares. He's like, okay, everybody, hey, look, can anybody withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He's like, let's dunk them right now. There's, they're, where are they at, church? They're on the coast. Man, it'd be cool to get baptized in the Mediterranean. That'd be pretty sweet. So, so he says this, verse 47, all right? So verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. So, and I like this little cap on the end. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Can you imagine what those days would have been like? Here they are. Cornelius has been seeking God his life, his whole life. He's, had, he's worked through what God has given him through general revelation, and now God has sent uh, Peter to come and preach the gospel not only does Cornelius get saved, but evidently, I don't know if everybody in that room got saved, but a whole bunch of them did. And then they all go down to the sea and they get baptized. And then they're all back at, back at the house. And these guys are eating ham sandwiches and all kinds of things that Peter's... Peter, I say that, but like, that's real, y'all. Like Peter's, he, this house would have had a lot of things in it. Peter's still like, they're like, hey, you want some of this? And he's like, how about an egg? You know, how, how, about, how about some bread? And... He's still no doubt. I don't think Peter's like, all right, let's have a low country boil now and I'll eat literally everything my whole life I stayed away from. But that stuff's there. They're on a coastal town. You know what, you know what people eat on coastal towns? They eat seafood. <laughs> they eat a lot of these things. So anyway, salvation requires, it requires that we are born of the Holy Spirit. Every saved person, you have the Holy Spirit. Okay? How many of you have ever heard someone say, or maybe you know of a church that says, you have to be baptized in water. You have to be dunked in water to be saved, right? I know of people, I know of churches that preach what we would call baptismal regeneration. In other words, that baptism is a part of your salvation. Well, what do they do with this part right here? Because it clearly says otherwise. I want you to write this down here. Right? I hope you're taking notes. I, you know, I encourage you to take notes. All right, write this down. The word baptism always means, I want you to say it with me here. The word baptism always means what? Immerse. But what we are immersed in is determined by the what? Context. The, if you, if you, and I'm going to give you not only, we're not only going to explain how we arrive at the right conclusion about baptism, but this is what keeps us on the straight and narrow regarding doctrine just in general is these principles. What we are immersed in is determined by its context. For the big, there's, there's a lot of good rules of what we call hermeneutics, which is how to study and understand our Bible. Principles like if I say the words exegesis and eisegesis, some of y'all are tracking with me. What I'm saying is this. There's, there's a lot of stuff there, but I just want to... Two, two things. There's two essential principles of interpreting Scripture. If you don't follow these, you end up in trouble. 
First of all, when you read Scripture, the Bible is clear that, that the Holy Spirit spoke through men and what these authors wrote had one intended interpretation. There's one interpretation of Scripture. How many of you have ever gone to a Bible study and people read it and they go, now what do you think it means? That's backwards, okay? We don't say, this is what I, this is what I think the Scripture is is, is telling us as far as its interpretation. There's one interpretation. That's the author's original intent. And not only is there the author's original intent, but then we have to understand the audience that it was written to, the time, the place. That's why at Living Hope, we spend a lot of time talking about the context. When it comes to Scripture, context is king. Can you say context is king with me? Ready? Context is king. That keeps us from going, getting off on some side paths we don't want to go down, from deviating what's being taught. So the first principle is understand the, the, the primary interpretation, the authorial intent. The second thing is this, and it's simple. Always interpret unclear or difficult Scripture in the light of clear Scripture. I'll be the, I, I study that book for a living, for my vocation, and there's times I'm like, what? Huh? There, there's stuff in there. I st- I'll be like, there are things I don't preach because I still don't understand them. I still can't get up here in co- with confidence and say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's what this is saying here. But we have to understand, there is so, like when it comes to our salvation, the Bible is so clear. And when it comes to this issue of baptism, I really feel like this, this shouldn't be such a confusing thing. When, it, when we look at baptism examples, okay, again, the Bible uses the word baptism in a lot of ways. Let me give you some uh, examples of the word baptism. <clears throat> and I have the references down. We're not going to go through all of this for time's sake, but I want to have at least a reference for you. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2, Paul talks about this, this phrase, the baptism of Moses. Now, some of y'all, you're like, the baptism of Moses? I, I have never even heard of that. And what Paul says is, <clears throat> he goes, they were identified with Moses and the deliverance by passing through the Red Sea, following God's presence in the cloud, right? Paul uses this phrase as a comparison to the way Christians are identified with Christ and his salvation. So he uses this phrase, the baptism of Moses. Now Moses didn't take the entire nation of Israel, right? Or all the Jews and, and baptize them all. No, what he's saying is, they were, they were baptized by going through these things together and they were a part of Moses in, in this, this, this early nation by going through that together. So there's, there's a difference. We, we know that baptism of Moses is not what we do up in this tank you know, uh, uh, several times a year. Well, then there was, when Jesus showed up, the baptism of John, John the baptizer. Mark 1-4, through 4, we see this in the Gospels. John says, I'm baptizing you. It's a baptism of what? Repentance. In other words... John the baptizer, John said, hey, the Messiah is coming, and you you need to understand, the Messiah is coming, and you are lost in your sins. Whenever we're told about sin, we're told to repent. So what John did was, basically John was saying, when you're getting baptized to acknowledge that this coming Messiah, that you are surrendered to Him, and, and that you need to turn from your sins and follow after Him. So we see that, that there was a baptism of John. Boy, we get into Luke chapter 3 and we see this, man, this phrase of being baptized by fire. In Luke 3 it says, John answered them, and, and, and saying, and Jesus says to them, I will baptize you with water, but he who is mightier, or John the Baptist said, I'll baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and fire. And we see this idea of baptism of the Holy Spirit, which we'll look at here in another minute. So then we see what we practice in the New Testament church, and that is the fifth one up there, or the fourth one, we see believer's baptism. Acts 2.42. And from here on out, that's belie- it's just believer's baptism. Uh, then in Acts 11.16, one of our upcoming verses, when Peter explains what happened, Peter uses the phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that's important is because that's, that's necessary for new life. No spirit, no salvation. So here's the question for you to write down. When it comes to getting baptism right, people say, does baptism save? And the answer is, well, which one? 
Okay? That's the question. Does baptism save? Well, which one? The, the Scripture is clear that if we are not immersed, if we are not baptized in the Holy Spirit through believing, that's what happens to these people at Cornelius. That is the story of Acts in the entire New Testament. Is when a person puts their faith in Christ, they are immersed, they are baptized in the Spirit. Let, let me give you an example here again. So in Galatians 3.27, Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Which baptism is he talking about? Well, we interpret the unclear with the clear. If we were to look at the context of Galatians chapter 3, just a few verses earlier, in 3.24, Paul says, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Not faith and water or faith and baptism. No, he, he says just verses earlier were justified by faith. All the verses that seem to give the idea that salvation for a, a, a Christian is believing and then getting baptized in water, right? There's always another verse nearby that, just, that, that clarifies it by saying salvation is believing. You look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. This is important. It says here, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. So that's talking about how when a person believes, we are baptized, we are immersed, right? The Holy Spirit immerses us. And he says, man, Jews and Greeks, slaves are free. All were made to drink of one Spirit. Another verse that, that kind of helps support this is Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9, it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now look what it says. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. It doesn't say those who haven't been baptized in water. It says they've got to be in the Holy Spirit. There is one baptism that unites you with Christ, and that is, that is the baptism upon belief, upon faith in Jesus. That's the baptism, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 says this. Ephesians 4, there's one body, there's one Spirit, as you were called, uh, next verse. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now you say, well, you just showed us examples of different baptisms. Those are different ways the word is used. So what is the one baptism that they're referring to? Well, it says there's one spirit, there's one faith. In other words, being a part of God's family, everybody in God's family has this one spirit, and they've been baptized in that one spirit. So we could do this and go on and on, but let's be clear. Let's be clear. After Acts 8, starting here in Acts chapter 10, the order is always this. Always. Hear the Word, believe on Christ, receive the Holy Spirit, be baptized, and that connects you in, in, in fellowship, that unites you with other believers in the church to serve and worship God. That's, that's such an important thing for us to wrap our minds around. If you have questions on that, be happy to talk further about that. But that's an important thing because I know there's a lot of good folks out there. Look, and I say all this, do you think for one second that I'm minimizing baptism? By no means. We're a church that loves baptisms because we love when people publicly say, I am identifying, I am, I am telling the world that I belong to Jesus. I am telling the world that I have believed. I'm, I'm actually holding myself accountable to this church by in front of you identifying with Jesus. So it's funny because I'll have people say, well, I know someone who's, who's saved, but they never got baptized. I know someone who professes Christ. How about that? I know someone who professes Christ, but they've never been baptized. Do you think they're saved? And I say, well, I, I can't, I, I, how am I to know that? I don't know. What I do know is if the first thing Jesus tells us to do after salvation is to get baptized and we call him Lord, if we call Him Lord, what should we, we do? What should we do? We should obey Him. So if we're serious about our faith, then yeah, it makes absolute sense that we would say, you know what, Jesus, this is super uncomfortable for me. I don't like to get in front of people. I don't like to be uh, this, you know, I don't like having eyeballs on me. And, but we say, but yes, I will do it because I do believe you are Lord. And I do believe you are Savior. So that's why, that's why baptism is such a big deal. It's a first step of obedience that, from a human perspective, it shows our faith to be valid by our agreeing to it and by our following Him and doing it. 
so important that we understand the role of baptism. So, at the end of this chapter, we see church, another reminder about the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Another reminder. Look, maybe you've noticed this morning while I've been preaching, I have a new sticker on the back of my iPad. And what that sticker is, I have a picture of it up here on the screen for you. We made a little sticker for you, okay? This sticker says, pray, fill, yield, repeat. And then in each of the four corners, it has a verse. We receive the Holy Spirit upon communion, upon, upon conversion. It's a one-time thing. But the Bible tells us we are to be in continually yielding, submitting, and obeying God through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. Let's go ahead and bring up Ephesians 5.18. Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be drunk with wine. Right? That's excess, that's debauchery, that's wrong. But be filled with the Spirit. And this is important to understand. In this text, in Greek, it is continuous. It literally means always be being filled. It means keep on being filled. Holy Spirit never leaves you or forsake you. We know that. All kinds of verses about that. But we are to constantly yield and submit to the Holy Spirit. You say, well, why? Because we oftentimes ignore the Holy Spirit or we act in the flesh and the Holy Spirit says, fine, you lead. Okay, that's why we have like these two verses up here on not quenching, right? Do not quench the Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, it's funny, that verse says don't grieve the Holy Spirit whom you were sealed by. In other words, He is your security. You don't lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's like, fine, hey, you want to do this? Knock yourself out. Now, I think the comparison and contrast to being filled with wine is interesting because When somebody has drank too much or drunk too much wine, everybody knows. How do they know? Because their behavior changes. Right? When somebody's had too much to drink, you're like, okay, it's, it's affected your behavior. So the contrast to being filled with wine is to be filled with what? The Holy Spirit. In other words, when people see us, they should think they're under the influence of something better than, right? Which is the Holy Spirit. But the problem is we act in the flesh. I mean, I've done that, right? You, 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 you come to this, uh, this you, you have an emotion, you have a feeling, you have a frustration, and the Holy Spirit's like, don't. You're like, be quiet. No, I'm going to say this. And then, you, and then people realize in that moment, you're not behaving with the Holy Spirit. So we quench the Spirit, we grieve the Spirit, which is why we have to continue. And we, we don't even realize it sometimes. We can go long periods of time as believers not even realizing how much we're just operating in the flesh. So we have on the tables when you leave this morning, we have those stickers for everybody. Okay? And I want you to to take one today. We we should have plenty for people to take more. Put that somewhere where it's going to remind you to just stop and say, Holy Spirit, I yield myself to You. I yield myself to You. Fill me with your spirit, all right? Uh, And and on that sticker, there are those four verses that we mentioned about the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, Worship team, if you go ahead and come on up here. You say, is that a Mother's Day present? Every mom needs to be... (laughs) Every mom needs the help of the Holy Spirit to deal with her husband and her children. And every kid needs the Holy Spirit to listen to his mama. So yes, they are not just for the moms, they are for everybody, and we want to encourage you. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and see this amazing, beautiful story all about salvation. It is about salvation, Lord. And I pray that as we've looked at this passage this morning, that you'd open up our eyes and help us to just follow the, follow the model and, and the template of Scripture when it comes to salvation. Lord, I beg and I pray that we would be a church that is full of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we have let some people who abuse that phrase ruin it for the rest of us. Call us back to repent from that. Lord, uh, the the, the Scriptures speak so uh, abundantly about not just our need, but Lord, life is better when we live lives yielded to and submitted to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we want to just say the words we want to say. And so we speak words from the flesh. And we cause a lot of damage because of that. God, we need to be a church. Living Hope, may Living Hope Bible Church be a a church full of people who are sold out and submissive to you through your Spirit, Lord. 
So descend on this place, we pray. We pray this in your strong name. Amen. All right, everybody.